Uh, he's going to talk about control of linear and nonlinear systems subject to a delay. Okay. okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, thank you, Luz, for the introduction. And um, I would like to, uh, many thanks to the organizer for the kind invitation uh, to present uh, this work. Um, and of course, thank you to, for everyone here for attending this uh, and uh, listening to my talk. So, which is going to be uh, about uh, prediction based control, actually. Uh, to uh, So, prediction based control for a dynamical system subject to a random input delay, which is a problem which we have been circling around with uh, some of my cursors for a couple of years now, maybe a bit more, and which for, on which we finally made some progress lately with uh, Sitia Kong, who is uh, my PhD student, who uh, is uh, working on this topic. So, of course, uh, feel free to interrupt me uh, anytime, uh, ask questions. Uh, the more interactive this thing is, the better it will be, of course. Um, yep. Yeah, so I'm going to start with a few words of motivation of why we are interested in this problem. So you know that time delays are uh, ubiquitous, of course, you encounter them in many contexts. Um, but most of the time, it's really just small delays due to uh, acquisition time and this type of thing due to sensor uh, sensing and so on. Uh, but when it's more, um, when the values are um, more important, it mo most of the time comes from physical transportation, meaning that you are uh, you really have a material which is transported from a point A to a point B, right? Um, and this is what we call transport delay most of the time. And a typical example, something that we can all experience in our in everyday life, uh, is the um, bath uh, dynamics or shower dynamics. So when you open the faucets uh, here and you wish to have a cold, uh, warm, sorry, uh, shower, you have to wait a little bit before entering the shower, right? Because uh, for a while, the uh, water which is leaving the faucet uh, is cold. And this is due to the fact that you have uh, water which was inside the pipe uh, during the all night, for example, and which is frozen then. Um, and depending on uh, the lungs of your pipe, this, this delay, this time you have to wait before uh, the warm water, which is in the nozzle, could be quite long or um, well short. But it depends on the way you act on the amount, the flow rate of, uh, of water flowing through the pipe. And in any case, what is going on here is that uh, the information or the data, the temperature here, which is sent through the, the pipe, won't uh, change order, meaning that uh, it will satisfy the first in, first out principle. Information that are entering the pipe in a given order will leave it in the same order. So uh, I'm giving this example of past shower, but this is also true on more uh, industrial examples, such as uh, blendings uh, in refineries. Uh, where instead of uh, water and shower, you have a crude and uh, a given recipe like octane numbers that you want to uh, leave the refinery and go to the gas station. And this is also true for internal combustion engines, uh, where you want to control as accurately as possible the composition of the gas into the um, combustion chamber here. And you do so uh, usually with uh, actuators which could be located far away. So this is a vast transportation, uh, a vast class, sorry, of delay. But um, when you have, so and most of the time, sorry, you when you uh, model this thing, you model the, the corresponding delay as a time differentiable function, and um, uh, it will satisfy this thing. D dot is smaller strictly than one, which means that you, if you look at the function t minus d of t, this thing is strictly increasing, meaning you won't go back in time, backward in time. This is not the case anymore when you look at uh, when the delay become uh, immaterial, meaning when it comes from a network, for example. So here I have um, a toy example where uh, I assume that my controller is talking to my plants through a network and that this network consists in three passes. Um, and one of the paths uh, has more nodes than the others. So if I have a routing algorithm on which I am alternating between these paths, here is what is going to go, what is going to happen. Uh, the first information goes through the first pass and reaches the plant uh, pretty quickly. The second one goes through the second pass and the third information passes the second one and arrives, kicks in the plant before the uh, second one. So you have reordering of information. 
And um, you have then a delay which could switch uh, pretty rapidly, right? So you have certain variation of this delay. And this depends on the congestion of the network, on um, the routing algorithm which is used, and very various uh, parameters which are complicated to model. So the easiest way to model this is as a random delay. Um, oh yeah, and uh, just for um, a more uh, practical, uh, physical, uh, uh, illustration of this phenomenon. Here is a screenshot uh, that I took when I was doing the slides of uh, the packet stake change by my computer. Uh, I'm just realizing that this is in French, so sorry for the non-French speaker, but uh, the important part is actually the plot which is here, and so it, it's not uh, French dependent. So in red you have uh, the packets which are leaving the computer, and in blue the one which are uh, entering it, and um, you can see so that the, the variation, the fluctuation of the number of packets pretty much resembles the uh, roof example that I was giving here. So you have a sudden and abrupt variation. Oh, and just for information, this graph I think is about is something about like two minutes. So you see that the sampling time is uh, quite high. So uh, this is uh, well a roof approximation, but you can assume that if uh, everything was uh, um, that if the picture was more accurate, you would have much more uh, variation of the delay. Anyway, so the problem is that uh, these type of delay variation are uh, almost never studied in the literature. Most of the time, uh, delays are either assumed as constant, or even if they are considered as time varying, they are always assumed to uh, satisfy this first in first out principle. Uh, it's either a prerequisite of the analysis, or uh, so you have this uh, assumption since the beginning of the analysis, or a consequence of the control design which is carried out. And even if this is uh, quite a challenging problem already to be dealing with time varying delay, of course, we are in the nice setting where um, the delay behaves nicely in some sense. So two exceptions should be noted, which uh, comes from the sample data uh, community by Emilia Friedman and co-authors, but those are really exceptions. Um, the rest, a large, vast majority of the works uh, actually assume uh, the delays to be FIFO. Um, you have a few exceptions uh, which are listed here and which are the only one I know up to my knowledge, which I've tried to focus on uh, this problem of going backward in times, let's say, uh, and they have this modeled the delay as a piecewise differentiable function such as uh, pictured here on, on this plot. But, uh, well, let's say that you have these three works, and after that, I'm not aware of anybody uh, trying to follow, uh, to keep this uh, trend living. And for one which reason, I believe, which is that uh, it, it was as far as one could go into uh, trying to model a random delay without actually uh, assuming it, uh, strictly speaking, as random. So it was a uh, deterministic uh, piecewise approximation of a random delay. So it was as far as one could go, but now it's time to actually move to directly take uh, the randomness into account. The thing is, um, most of the people didn't do it. Um, you have a lot of work who have dealt with stochastic differential delay equation, but most of the time, uh, the delay itself is not assumed to be a random uh, process. It's assumed to be a constant, the time uh, varying delay, but not uh, a random one. The only examples that I have, uh, so are not specifically into uh, our field, meaning it's more on consensus of graph topology, uh, distributed agent and this type of thing. Um, on control perspective and from a time delay perspective, um, and few works, uh, this is the only one I know I've dealt with that. And among with these uh, examples, we had an approach which uh, thought um, corresponding to our purposes, which is the last one, the one by uh, Kolmanowski in the beginning of the year 2000, which uh, modeled the uh, delay as a Markov process with a finite number of values and used something which is called a constant delay averaging approach, which I'm going to detail later. So this is basically this approach that we're going to follow um, in this presentation. So um, here is the problem to start with a few equations that uh, I'm going to study. So uh, I'm going to focus on trying to control a linear time invariant plant, which is subject to a time varying delay D, which is actually a random uh, process. And more specifically, D is assumed to be a Markov process, which takes a finite number of values uh, that I'm going to call D1 up to DR, uh, assuming that all of these values are ordered 
and uh, upper and lower bounded by strictly positive numbers, D that I'm calling D bar and D of. And um, we can define as well the transition probability, PIG T1, T2, which quantifies the probability to switch from one value DI at time T1 to another with the same value, but DJ, at time T2. And we assume that this transition probability are differentiable function and that they satisfy, but this is uh, like the definition of this transition probability, that they satisfy the probability that their sum uh, is equal to one, um, whatever, uh, time T1 and T2 we are looking at. Okay, um, so I'm gonna focus on this problem for most of the presentation and hopefully if I have time at the end, I'm gonna say a few words about uh, the extensions that we've done lately uh, of this work for the nonlinear case. Okay, oh, sorry. So what we wish is to um, uh, stabilize this plant. And what we're gonna do is design a prediction-based controller um, um, to try to make the delay disappear from the closed loop of uh, dynamics, but this has a few challenges that I'm gonna try to uh, present now. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with these techniques, here is a sum up. The idea uh, which was developed uh, in the beginning of the 60s um, uh, for the frequency domain uh, under the name Smith predictor and uh, in the time domain uh, by, uh, under the name finite spectrum assignment by Manitou, Sandelbro and uh, Quan and Pearson uh, is the following. So if you have a linear dynamics with a constant delay, better can be done than uh, simply picking the linear feedback U equal Kx. Actually, what you can do is instead of using the current value of the state, take a future value t plus x of t plus d. So if you do so, when you use this, um, when you use this control law and you plug it back into the dynamics, what you get is uh, directly that the, two, the, delay, the plus d here and the minus d here will compensate, and you make the delay disappear, and you simply get x dot equal a plus bkx, so the nominal delay free exponential convergence. And you get that after d units of time because um, the original for the original d first d units of time, um, you basically uh, are subject to the initial condition of the input and you can't act on it. Anyway, uh, so this is of course something which is really interesting because then you make the delay disappear from the closed loop dynamics. So uh, you recover the uh, all the transient performances and the finite uh, dimension that you would have expected to get. As you, if you could, you would not have the delay, but you have it. So the only problem is that uh, this thing may appear to be non-causal, but actually you can uh, write um, an implementable expression of this thing because you can solve this uh, dynamics over uh, D, um, a time window of length uh, D units of time uh, using the variation of constant formula. And here, normally the integral should be between T and T plus D, but as the uh, input uh, is delayed, you can make a simple change of variable and express it as a function which, as an integral, which involves only the past value of the input and the current value of the state. So this is something which is completely causal and implementable. Okay. And this uh, can be extended to time varying delays and it has been um, in the 90s by Anitila. So in, you don't simply uh, copy and paste the previous, um, the previous uh, controller I was showing here by replacing D by D of T. You do something a bit more elaborate, which is to consider the inverse of a function R, which to T associates T to T minus D of T. Um, because by doing so, then you take into account the fact that the uh, delay changes between the time you compute your control law and the time it reaches the plant. And if you do so, then this R minus one uh, will cancel out with this R and you uh, uh, as well recover the case uh, X dot equal A plus BK X in closed loop. But uh, the thing is that this technique requires, uh, of course, some smoothness. It requires D to be uh, continuously differentiable, bounded, and R to be invertible. Um, and this is something which, uh, of course, has no reason to hold in the stochastic case because the delay is non-smooth. So we have no regularity assumption. We have um, we don't we may not have invertibility of this R function. So this seems very uh, complicated to do. And uh, in any case, uh, this is what something which could be which is illustrated on the graph. Um, 
if you want to have r minus one at time t, so you will have to have a point which is some, somewhere here, let's say. So you need to have the future, uh, so to, pro to have a prolongation of this curve here, of this red curve. And to do so, you need to have the future value of the blue one, which means have the, pr the future value of the delay. Um, and this is, of course, something which seems very unrealistic from a practical point of view. You may have an ID, a rough ID, but not know exactly what will be the uh, future delay. So this is why instead of trying to apply this thing here in the uh, stochastic delay case, we'll try to, lie on, uh, to rely on um, robustness results, which were obtained for prediction-based controller lately uh, in the deterministic delay case, of course. So um, the three papers that I'm uh, sitting here um, present the case where the uh, prediction-based prediction used in the control is not actually exactly um, predicting the correct uh, state, uh, you make an error in the delay and you actually have some robustness properties. So this is a trend that we propose to follow uh, in the context of stochastic delay in the follow. So uh, I'm gonna just uh, say a few words then now about uh, what is the actual control design that we chose and the results that we have of uh, robust compensation. But uh, I'm gonna move quickly to the proof of this result because this is a part where, uh, which is gonna be the most interesting to you, I think, because this involves PDEs first. And second, because the uh, stability analysis tools that I'm gonna introduce here uh, could be reproduced in a much larger context than the one I'm presenting. Um, and I believe could pave the way towards uh, very uh, interesting uh, problems for uh, connection of PDEs and ODEs. Uh, so then I'm going to illustrate these results with uh, some simulation results and hopefully if I have time, um, give say a few words about extending this result to uh, nonlinear dynamics. So uh, back to the problem I was talking about. We uh, wish again to stabilize this plant. Uh, in which D is a Markov process. Again, so the same um, is the exact same slide as the one I was uh, presenting previously. Uh, but D here now being a Markov process, so X uh, is driven by a stochastic signal here. So X instead is uh, itself is going to be an RN valued random variable now. Okay, and uh, the uh, Prediction-based control that we present, that we propose, is the following. So it's a recopy, basically, of the uh, prediction-based control we had previously, and we pick a certain horizon prediction, D0, which could be as we want for the moment, we don't know. The only, uh, the only assumption that we make is that this D0 makes sense um, in, in the sense that it belongs to uh, the interval uh, Dnf, Dsup, that we know all the delay value belongs to. But that's all for the moment that we assume. Um, and we make this choice because, as I was saying, we don't know what is the future values of the delay. We don't know how it's going to behave. Uh, it's pretty non-smooth. And finally, um, we even if we know the current value of the delay, we have no reason whatsoever to use it because it's going to vary so much in the future that maybe using the current value is actually worse than um, picking a constant one. So. This is why we make this choice. And the result we have is the following. So it is that there exists a certain constant epsilon such that if the difference between D0, this prediction horizon, and every value, possible value of the delay DJ is smaller than epsilon, then we have um, uh, exponential convergence in the mean square sense of a functional epsilon which is um, the sum of the Euclidean norm of X and an L2 norm of U. But on an horizon, which is a bit longer than what could expect, it's uh, between T minus D bar minus D zero and T. Uh, and the reason for that will, uh, well, I'm gonna comment on that later, why the horizon is a bit longer than one could uh, hope for. It comes from the stability analysis. Okay, so we have a mean square uh, exponential uh, stability result, which uh, well, the mean square makes sense because we're in a stochastic context. And um, we have a conditional expectation. So this thing means that uh, epsilon is supposed to be at time zero, uh, is supposed to be, to be taken the value epsilon of zero, which is given. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna say a few words about the main part of, it, of this uh, theorem, which is the, um, condition, which is uh, highlighted in red here. So a direct consequence of this thing 
first is that to be able to pick D0 such that this condition uh, is, is ensured, you have uh, first all the delay value of the DJ should be close enough, right? Because if they're not, then there is no hope for D0 to be close enough to each of them. So um, a, direct com, a direct consequence of this thing is that the uh, range of the delay has to be sufficiently narrow. And then you have, uh, if it is the case, to pick D0 in the vicinity in this range, close enough at least. Okay, and um, this result then should be understood directly as a robustness result, as the one that we were expecting, because um, it simply says that if, uh, these, if all the values are close enough to D0, that this prediction uh, will be accurate enough. And this is actually the results that were, um, Okay, that were given in these three papers, uh, especially the second one, the one by Karafilich and uh, Kirstich, uh, only deals on um, these uh, properties and does not restrict the delay rate, which is the case for the uh, first one and the, the third one. So we basically have extended uh, with this result the uh, robustness properties results that were uh, true in the deterministic case. Okay, so this is the first thing. So let me now uh, present you the, the uh, proof of this result, which in itself is actually more interesting than the result itself, I believe. So uh, we, the, this proof is a mix between two different things. The first elements are um, actually kind of standard, the one that we use in the terministic case uh, for input delays. So it involves the transport PDs and so on. Um, backstepping transformation, as you will see. But uh, we had to mix them with uh, elements that are uh, very specific to the stochastic case. Um, and the mix of the two things is, um, is novel and explain why we were interested in the constant deleveraging approach. So um, to handle the fact that we have um, several possible uh, delay values, we represent each delay by a transport distributed actuator. So for each value dj of the delay, we uh, define a vj, which is a distributed actuator of u between times. Uh, so uh, vj it depends on x and t, x belonging to the interval 0, 1. So, uh, this vj corresponds to u between uh, time t minus dj and time t. So indeed, this vj, so it's represented, let's say, for uh, j equal 1, so for d1. Here, you have u, which enters the channel over there, which propagates, which is speed uh, 1 over d1, and which leaves the channel as the value y, uh, u of t minus d1. Okay. U do the same for d2, d3, so on. Um, and as the delay are uh, supposed to be ordered, um, these speeds are um, decaying, decreasing, sorry. Um, okay, but at each time t, you only have one of the output of this channel, which is gonna reach the OD. Uh, so you can see this as a selector uh, and uh, kind of a switching system uh, in which delta uh, behaves as the, uh, what I'm gonna uh, present, behaves as the uh, switching signal and you uh, have, the OD is either subject to V1 of zero T or V3 of zero T and so on. So to define this properly, here is the um, actual uh, uh, rigorous dynamics of this thing. So if you define Vj, as I was saying here, uh, each Vj will satisfy a transport PD with speed one over Dj, which corresponds to the purple dynamics over there. Uh, v bold here is just uh, the concatenation of uh, every coordinates Vj. And so it's a vector in RR. Uh, lambda D here is a diagonal matrix whose components, uh, diagonal components are D1 up to DR. Okay, uh, and it is fed by U of T uh, at the boundary X equal one. And then its output cascades into X, the dynamics of X, I mean the OD, through um, the random process delta. So this pro random process is introduced such that delta T is actually equal to EI Z is um, canonical uh, vector of uh, the is vector of the canonical basis of RR, if and only if dt is equal to di. Okay, so we have uh, so this delta will be uh, a vector which will select which component of the bar the bold is acting on x. And so we've moved from um, a representation in which we had a random delay 
to a representation in which we have a finite number of transport PDs cascaded through um, a random process into an ID. And of course, as this thing is linear, it's easier to uh, handle, but we'll see how we do that. First, um, we use, uh, we extend a bit the system with uh, um, an additional distributed actuator, which corresponds to the uh, horizon uh, of prediction. And this is something that is usual with input device system. So um, we define V hat, which is U, but now between T minus D zero and T because so it's kind of redundant with the channels we already had here, but um, it's specific to the controller uh, and it's a delay which could be different from every delay that we have here. So uh, even if it's somehow redundant, it's gonna be easier to uh, for the stability analysis of this thing. So um, this V hat now satisfies again a transport PDE here and is fed by U and it cascades into X. And instead of keeping the V that we had before, now I'm gonna define a narrow variable, which is the, so the tilde, which is the difference between V and this V hat. And uh, it's again, uh, proper uh, cascades into X through the uh, action of this um, uh, Markov process delta. Um, the V tilde uh, again satisfy some sort of transport PD, but it has a source term, which is uh, V hat uh, coupled uh, into V tilde. Uh, note that the boundary condition of the tilde is equal to zero, which is something which is uh, fine from a stability properties point of view. And the sigma d in the end here, which is given, is a given vector, uh, which is the difference between uh, the current uh, delay, uh, the sorry, the prediction delay, the prediction horizon, and the delay values. So the problem is just that uh, no, uh, having um, this part of fiat is not very easy to analyze. So instead of uh, keeping this system, we will uh, use a backstepping transformation. Uh, so use a W now, which is defined as follows, um, as um, a second order Volterra equation, uh, a second type, sorry, a Volterra integral equation of the second kind. Um, and which has the probability, so the formula in itself does not matter. It's just that basically this thing is kind of a prediction over time horizon D zero X, but the main part, important part, point is that uh, W1T is equal to zero. And when you write the uh, expression of um, uh, the dynamics of W, now you uh, have two PDs which are fed by zero and two transport PDs fed by zero. So this is something which is uh, easier to analyze, uh, of course. The problem is that now uh, by gaining this, this zero boundary condition, you have added a coupling between an extra coupling uh, between V tilde and W. So uh, not only uh, is still W acting on V tilde as V hat was acting on V tilde, but V tilde is now also acting on W and with uh, this, um, through this stochastic Markov process. So, um, but you've gained also something which is that the black term here of the part which is in, uh, autonomous in X is now stable. So if you had no W zero, no V tilde, this thing will converge, so it would be okay. Um, okay, so we have three difficulties here, two difficulties, sorry, to um, skip, to start the analysis of the system. The first one is directly due to the red term here, uh, due to the stochastic nature of the system. But this, let's forget about it for a moment because um, I'm gonna detail it later. The second one um, is actually due to uh, the coupling between the system because you can see that the function H here which is actually a rewriting of V hat X involves W X. And this W X is not part of the state of the system. So what you would do usually uh, to be able to cope with this problem is to um, go to the upper order in terms of special derivative. Instead of studying the system in L2, you will study it in H1. But you can do that here simply because um, W uh, involves the dynamics of W involves delta. So you have this, pro this uh, random process which appears in, in the loop and uh, you don't have enough regularity to go to uh, upper uh, derivative. So you can do that. So what we do instead is that using the fact that uh, this function is V hat X originally 
and that v hat is defined as a pass value of u, we um, write this thing as time derivative of u, past time derivative of u. Um, and originally, so the one that um, are, so it's for time t plus d0 x minus one. So if we have a time uh, during the d uh, bar un first units of time, we don't know what it is because it's gonna be just the initial condition of the system and we can hack on it. But after that, we know that this u hat, this u dot, sorry, is actually given by the time derivative of the uh, controller we picked. And this, we have an expression of it. So, um, and it actually depends on x and on past value of u. But now the thing is that this past value of u uh, are on an horizon which is a bit um, uh, longer than uh, the one we were dealing uh, with uh, for the moment. So we have to uh, extend against our, the target system, but that's the last thing we're gonna uh, do. And this is a final uh, version we're gonna uh, keep. So we introduce this mu here, uh, which completes u. So previously u was um, uh, considered between t minus uh, d0 and t by v hat and uh, t minus d bar, t minus d3, d2, d2 etc. by uh, the v, v tilde and uh, the, the bold v. Now we also introduce this mu which uh, looks for u between t minus d0 d bar and t minus uh, d0. So uh, this explained, by the way, by introducing this mu, this explains why we have this horizon of t minus d0 minus d bar in the uh, um, theorem I was showing um, previously. So uh, now h can be written as a function of mu, and mu uh, satisfy a transport PDEs, and uh, x and w cascade into mu. So uh, let's look, stop for a minute on this equation, because uh, it explains everything, actually, even if this is a bit complicated. So let's forget about this term, sigma d, for a moment. If, it, if this term was not there, what would have happened? Then v tilde would be um, equal to zero in finite time, because this is a transport PD. And this v tilde, it cascades into w and x. Okay. So after a while, uh, v tilde here should be equal to zero. And w, in turn, will, uh, which satisfy again a transport PD, will be equal to zero in finite time. So again, when you look at the dynamic of x, these two things vanish in finite time. So x, in turn, will be uh, decaying exponentially to zero. And mu, as, uh, as a boundary condition, something which is decaying to zero, something which is going to zero in finite time, so it will, in, in turn, um, simply um, decay to uh, zero exponentially. So the overall system, if sigma d was not uh, here, would uh, converge to zero exponential. But sigma d is here. But what is this term? Sigma d is nothing more than the difference between the prediction horizon and uh, all possible delay values. So if we assume that this thing is small enough, we can hope that through a small condition, the, over the uh, exponential stability will still hold. And this is actually what we have uh, from uh, in the stability analysis. Okay, but before going to that, um, I'm gonna uh, I need uh, to define properly uh, how this thing behaves. So I'm gonna define a state psi as, uh, so x, w, v tilde mu, the state of this uh, extended target system. And it belongs to um, the set that I defined here. So actually you have to uh, complement this set with the boundary condition of the system, but I didn't write it on the slide because it would, uh, or it's already a mess. So I did not want to uh, have a huge slides. Okay, so uh, we define our states now. So it has the OD states and uh, free PDEs uh, states. And we have a well positiveness result, which is the following. So we um, need to uh, define what we mean by a solution to this stochastic delay variable, so this stochastic uh, differential equation, sorry. So we are looking at, thi at things uh, in, in under a weak, um, um, a weak sense, because of course, uh, having this um, random process into the loop means that uh, things won't uh, be exactly differentiable, right? So um, we uh, consider a solution to the closed loop system to be a triple of x, ut, and d, 
belonging, so which are Rn times L2 times R valued random variable, the realization, the realization of which satisfy an integral form of the closed loop dynamics. And we say the same for the target system, meaning uh, that it will uh, satisfy uh, the, if the realization of uh, the, process, the psi will satisfy an integral form of uh, the ODE and against its function for the uh, PDs. And the result we have is that whatever initial condition we pick uh, into Rn times L2 for x0, e0, the closed loop system has a unique solution and the ODE part is defined uh, under this form, uh, which is a classical usual solution, right? It's just that here, the integral that we have, um, the exist its existence uh, stems, so it's not, uh, of course, uh, the, the integrand is not continuous, but the integral exists, it stems from the uh, Lebesgue con con dominated convergence theorem. And consequently, as a closed loop system as a unique weak solution, the target system as well. Uh, and this is a consequence uh, directly of the way we constructed the target system, which is just um, a reformulation of the closed loop system plus uh, additional variables that we added, but which are nothing more than transport variable. Uh, and why is that important? Well, that's because once we have this uh, weak solution existence result in unicity, sorry, so zero positiveness result, we know that psi delta will define a continuous time mark of process. Um, so it's no longer one with a finite number of value because psi can take values into a continuum set, but that's a continuous time mark of process now. And correspondingly, we can actually move to uh, a Lyapunov analysis. We know which tool to use. So I'm going to present them. So first, the Lyapunov function that uh, I'm taking is the following one. It's a sum of a quadratic term, which is usual, um, the one that you usually take in finite dimension with p being a solution to a Lyapunov equation. And we had free uh, L2 modif modified L2 norm for each of the um, PDE's state. So we could have used the uh, more usual exponential term here, but one plus X is fine. Um, and we have a sum here because V tilde actually is our component. Um, finally, B, C, D are tuning uh, parameters that we tune in the stability analysis to get the convergence. Okay, but this thing is, of course, not differ directly differentiable. So instead of, uh, so we introduce the concept of infinitesimal operator, which is defined here, LV, is the limb sub as delta tends to zero of the difference between the conditional expectation of V at time T plus delta T minus V at time T divided by delta T. Um, so this is nothing more than the Dini derivative of the conditional expectation of the variable. And um, so intuitively, what is going on? Um, when um, delta t is small enough, uh, this thing will be close to um, the probability of switching between time t, uh, of switching between two values, uh, between time t and time t plus delta t, times the evolution of the function following a given um, dynamics with a fixed value of the delay. So roughly speaking, this thing is then the sum of PIG T, T plus delta T times V um, behaving as if the delay was constant, right? So when you take the is, um, derivative, so it's a growing rate, uh, you end up uh, taking a time derivative of V uh, as if the dynamics was constant, okay? And differentiating because this is a product, differentiating as well the uh, probabilities over there. But the um, Lyapunov function that we chose here does not depend explicitly on the delay. So we can put this V out of the sum, um, take as well the derivative out of the sum, and here we recover the sum of the probabilities, which is equal to one. So this term is actually zero and this term disappears. And we just end up uh, with the sum of uh, the probabilities to switch from between two values at uh, between zero and uh, time t, and the derivative of uh, the Lyapunov functional as if the delay was fixed uh, into the dynamics. 
So this explains why this is called a constant delay averaging approach. Uh, that's because you basically uh, analyze the uh, Lyapunov functional as if the delay was constant, so as if you had no randomness into the system, and then you take the average. So that's pretty easy to handle. Uh, this is what we did. So with this uh, Lyapunov functional I was showing, and the result we have is that uh, if we assume that we have this uh, com that the, this bond on uh, the difference between the nominal delay, uh, the prediction delay, and uh, the all delay values, we can show that L v is smaller than minus eta minus g of epsilon v, where eta is a positive constant, and um, g of epsilon is a function which uh, tends to zero as epsilon tends to zero. And this is of course something which is very interesting, right? Because what you're gonna do is that pick simply epsilon small enough so that eta minus g epsilon is, is positive. So this is what we do. Um, and we end up with uh, something like this, LV um, less or equal to minus eta zero V. And now, as we know that um, uh, V uh, is a function of a Markov process, we can use Dinkin's formula to integrate this equation and get, so if you're not familiar, this is a uh, classical uh, formula for Markov process. But anyway, uh, we, we, this thing basically integrate this equation and uh, you get, so using applying Renoir's uh, inequality, the, the uh, mean squared exponential result that you expect. What well, not exactly entirely, because this uh, formula are only valid for T larger than D bar because of the, um, uh, of the issue regarding the v hat, this mu that I was talking about uh, previously. The formula here that we uh, are using are only valid uh, after a certain time. But you can um, relate uh, the uh, initial condition with what is going on at time t equal d bar by the fact that the system does not escape in finite time because uh, we have a linear system. And now using the fact that V and epsilon are equivalent, you get the results that uh, I, uh, I presented. Okay, so just a few uh, simulation results to uh, illustrate what's going on. So um, this is a, um, a complete tie example on a second order system with um, undumped, uh, an undumped oscillator actually. So uh, an oscillator with negative damping, which uh, has no, no meaning, but anyway. Uh, so the uh, open loop dynamics of this thing is unstable. Uh, we pick the feedback gain as minus one, two, and it is such that the uh, closed loop uh, response time is supposed to be around two seconds. The initial condition is chosen as a one, zero, and uh, as zero for the input. We picked uh, five different delay values which are uh, 0 0.5 up to 1.5 and uh, uniformly distributed. And finally, we considered uh, the transition probabilities to uh, be um, time varying as follows to follow this, uh, this equation that are called Kolmogorov equations and which uh, uh, follow directly from uh, the definition of the Markov process and uh, the definition of the transition probabilities. Uh, so those, um, are a differential equation which depend on two uh, time varying uh, function uh, which are positive valued called uh, CJ and nu kg. Uh, and those parameters are such that CJ is actually equal to the sum of the nu GK. Um, and actually, um, if you assume that you have a initial condition which makes sense, meaning that they are equal to one if uh, e, uh, i and j are equal and uh, equal to zero otherwise, uh, you can show that the solution of this equation indeed uh, always is a transition probability because uh, the sum of the probability will be equal to one and each value will take value into, and each uh, pij will take value into the interval zero one. Okay, um, and in simulation, we picked these uh, values Cj and nu Kg such that um, we have initially uh, a delay which uh, moves um, between one and 1.25 mainly, so which is kind of um, restricted to these two values, meaning that the probabilities of switching from these values to any other one uh, is very, very small. But gradually, it evolves towards something which uh, is uh, evenly distributed in some sense between uh, three values, which are D2, D3, D4. Okay. 
of course, the probability of uh, switch of switching to D1 or D4, uh, D5 at any time is not zero. So sometimes you have uh, these uh, switches. So, and we picked here in this case, our uh, prediction horizon as equal to one. And you can see that here, so here it's one realization uh, and the corresponding uh, input, uh, input uh, in orange and in yellow and purple, you have the two states. And you can see that though a bit oscillatory, the uh, trajectories uh, converge. So um, it's indeed a bit oscillatory in the sense that we said that the um, nominal, uh, nominal um, response time was supposed to be two seconds and you can see that it's much larger here. But uh, we keep the convergence and we would not have been able to obtain it if we had been using a proportional uh, feedback. And here are uh, the results um, obtained for um, 100 trials. And you can see that the trend are um, almost similar. Uh, so this is for the uh, logarithm in the logarithm scale of the norm of the state and here for the signal. Um, and uh, the colored line here uh, represents the mean square and of the signal of the trajectories and plus or minus the standard deviation. Okay, but um, initially the input, so the, the DLI, sorry, was switching between one and 1.25 and we have no idea of knowing what could have been the correct delay value to pick, right? So if we had chosen 1.25, the thing is, as we had no idea in, to predict that it would actually uh, start picking a smaller value as delay um, around 1.75, uh, it would have resulted into an unstable dynamics as could be observed here. So it's the same here. It's one example of realization and here are the results of 100 trials. So which means that um, actually uh, picking the um, delay, uh, the, horizon, the horizon prediction is of course uh, very dependent on the current delay distribution. And we are completely ignoring this point in our analysis. We're kind of taking the worst case scenario where we can uh, indeed, um, um, sorry, where we can indeed, uh, where the delay can take and reach any value uh, among the R possible uh, values. And uh, that may be over, um, um, well, killing the easy job because the, um, all every value, all, all the values possibly taken by, taken by the delay may not actually be really taken right now. So as it is a case in the simulation where the 1.5 and the 0 0.5 are never taken basically. So uh, picking the, uh, the zero uh, in the worst case scenario as we're doing right now may be missing something and it will be uh, interesting to uh, distinguish between two delay distribution in future works. So um, I think I have a couple of minutes just to um, show you what, how, what are the extensions that we did pre lately. So um, we considered the problem of uh, nonlinear uh, systems now. So the delay definition is exactly the same as previously, but now instead of having a linear dynamics, we have a nonlinear one. So what does it change? Uh, for the first thing is that, uh, and this is standard, this is what is done for uh, prediction based control for nonlinear system in the um, deterministic uh, context. We have to assume that the system does not escape in finite time, because if it is, then for a certain value of the delay, the one which has, are uh, larger than um, the escape time, of course, the control won't even have the opportunity to kick in. Uh, the or system will have already exploded and there is no way to uh, um, get it back. So we assume that there, therefore for this reason, we assume that the uh, dynamics is strongly forward complete, which guarantees then that the system won't, uh, ex, uh, won't uh, diverge in finite time. And um, origin, so in the linear case, we were uh, considering the linear feed, classical standard linear feedback, but in the nonlinear case, we don't have a magical recipe which uh, uh, works for uh, any in any case. So we have to assume that we know um, a nominal feedback law, which uh, we assume to be a, C, a, a class C1 feedback law, and uh, which in the nominal delay free cases um, is such that uh, if we pick X0 in a given basin of attraction A, the plant uh, 
x dot equal f of x and kappa of x is exponentially stable. So meaning that without delay, we know that we have exponential stability. This is what we assume. And then now what we do is simply, we use this feedback law, but instead of using the uh, current delay value, we uh, pick, we use, we feed this uh, feedback law with the prediction. Uh, the prediction now can't be expressed with a variation of constant formula as was previously done, but you can define it implicitly um, as before. Um, not, not as before, you can define it implicitly as you could have done before, but before you add an explicit expression, so that was easier. Uh, the thing is here, we do not, uh, again, we use an horizon of prediction D0 instead of uh, the actual future delay, which we don't know and which uh, may not be computable. Okay, and under all of this uh, assumption, the uh, result we have is the following. It's very similar to uh, the one we had before, um, actually no difference at all. One uh, small one, which is that we have to uh, restrict the initial condition. Uh, so meaning that for any compact of initial conditions that we pick inside the basin of attraction, um, we have to guarantee the fact that after d units of time, uh, when the control kicks in, we are still inside the domain, um, the basin of attraction. Otherwise, things don't work. And this is why we have to restrict the initial condition, right? We have to go into a smaller compact for uh, the delay after d units of time to, for the system after d units of time to be still in the uh, original compact C. So uh, I would like just to make a remark, which is that uh, the assumptions that we made on uh, the, the assumption two that we made uh, that uh, we have uh, in the delay free nominal case an exponentially stable system is not something which is limiting because um, you simply have cases where you don't have a delay margin in um, if the uh, origin is only asymptotically stable. Um, so this is a case, for example, in this uh, in this study example, which is given in uh, Laurent Prali's uh, textbook. So it's an oscillator here, um, but the second coordinate is also subject to this minus x2 cube term. So you know that uh, x dot equal minus x, uh, x cube is one of the uh, few examples that we know of system of easy system, which are uh, asymptotically stable, but are not exponentially stable. Uh, so this explains why we have this x2 cube here. So uh, for this system, the origin uh, is asymptotically stable if d is equal to zero, um, but not exponentially stable. And uh, whatever d strictly positive you take, you can show that the origin is actually unstable. So this is what I mean by having zero delay margin. Uh, for this example, this is because you don't have a, a attractiveness of the origin. Uh, you can show that, uh, I believe those are circles, but you have periodic solution, uh, whatever, um, uh, as close as you, uh, as you initialize your, your system from the origin. Okay, so uh, if you have zero delay margin, then of course the thing is, there is no hope at all to try to use uh, a robust approach as the one we are proposing here. So um, in that sense, it's not restrictive to consider that the um, dynamics is uh, in nominally uh, uh, exponentially stable. Okay, um, so to conclude this talk, all the things, the materials I presented here uh, is not uh, published yet. The linear part, which was the main part, uh, is under submission to Automatica. And the second uh, journal, uh, the second uh, part, sorry, for the extension to nonlinear dynamics uh, is the subject of a journal paper under preparation, but nothing for the moment uh, is available on archive or whatever. Uh, just if you are interested. Uh, but this opens a large uh, new challenging question, in my opinion. Uh, and a lot of works now could be achieved uh, in this field. The first one is, um, I'm gonna list a couple of questions from the uh, most, uh, um, the one I'm gonna, uh, I think could be achieved easily, uh, well, a direct extension and the one which are more uh, open. So the first thing could be how to distinguish between delay distributions, because as I was saying, now we are kind of taking the worst case scenario uh, where we have a uniform distribution between all uh, delays, but this um, is of course a bit restrictive. 
Uh, something which uh, goes into the same uh, direction is uh, to try to take the current delay distribution into account to uh, adapt the prediction horizon, because at some point it may be useful to take the uh, average of the delay, but at some point realize that actually uh, or Earl takes the average of the delay all the time, but then it will uh, probably uh, vary with the delay distribution, for example. Um, also, I did not say, uh, yeah, I did not comment on that, but of course, this epsilon star that I showed during all the talk is directly depend on the feedback gain. And in practice, you can't act on the delay, but you can act, of course, on your feedback gain because you choose it. So um, you may want to uh, use I guess, we guess a small gain in order to uh, have something which has more robustness properties. But the influence of the feedback gain on this robustness has to be uh, carefully studied and can't be uh, done in all likelihood with the framework we adopted because uh, Yapunov analysis is of course um, not uh, the uh, suitable tools for, for this type of things. Um, a more complex question could be how to extend this thing for a continuum set of delays, because we're assuming that we had only a finite number of them. Um, maybe it's as easy as simply using a, um, a density or a continuity argument, but uh, this is a question which has to be dealt with carefully. Uh, and fa finally, and probably more interestingly, uh, I believe that the result I presented today could be um, be the ground for a large methodology of stability analysis for uh, random cascades of PDs or of uh, hyperbolic PDs into ODEs or this type of things, for example, um, and that could pave the way for uh, a large number of extension. Okay, so uh, I would like to thank you all for, for your attention. And of course, if you have questions, uh, feel free to, to ask them. Thank you very much, uh, Delphine. Uh, very nice talk, very, but very complicated. I yeah. <laughs> I have to read things uh, with patience, so I don't know. There are a lot of equations. I have to agree. <laughs> Eva, I think. Uh, yes. So thank you, Delphine, for this uh, very nice talk. So uh, in fact, I didn't uh, really understand at what point you need to have a, a finite set of delays. Um, Can you try to explain it more. Yep. Well, actually, it's really. Maybe it's it's not the case to be honest, but um, um, yep. So in the analysis everywhere, we are assuming that we have uh, that this uh, v tilde here. So let me go back to uh, a slide which is more understandable. This one, for example, at the beginning, this v is um, as our component. So I believe that indeed you could simply say, okay, it's it takes value into a continuous set, and that's all. And that could be okay. But um, I'm not sure that this part here, where uh, we relate the infinitesimal operator to um, this average, if this formula would still hold uh, with an integral, um, I'm not sure about that. Because if you had, uh, sorry, if you had um, an infinite number of possible delay values, then you probably would have to replace this sum here by an integral. And um, mm -hmm. yep, uh, I, I don't know if this uh, formula will still hold in the uh, in the case of uh, uh, an infinite number of delay values. Okay. Uh, Amori, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, you very much for thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I have a very simple question, which is: uh, Is it possible to have uh, an estimate on on epsilon of k? Uh, from you mean from the Lyapunov analysis? Yes. Yeah. So we have a formula. I didn't give it on the slide because okay. it's um, we have a formula. Of, we we have an expression of g of epsilon in a, in our proof. Okay. It's just that honestly, I have no hopes that this will be in any way helpful. <laughs> okay. Because okay. Uh, it comes from uh, bonds and uh, Young's inequality and so on that we did uh, without uh, being careful at all. So. So so I think so it's so, so there's a chance that even even taking uh, a, a matrix k such that uh, such that this system is, is very very stable uh, in x. Uh, no, it will work. Uh, it will give. Um, I mean, if if you pick, so we have an expression of epsilon star, and you can of course pick it in simulation, 
but what I'm saying is that it's going to be over conservative. So it's going to okay. kill uh, everything, and it's uh, it's likely to be very very far from the actual uh, delay margin of the system. Okay. I think. But but is there any chance that uh, that this uh, eta minus g epsilon could could tend to to a very high value or at or infinity when uh, when k when the when the dk uh, imposed by k goes to infinity or uh, I doubt it. Uh, we'll have okay. to go through it to to look okay. at how it, it will move. But we know that uh, we know that uh, eigen observer, for example, have uh, well, when you look at eigen observers, uh, you have a trade-off to reach between, uh, okay. and you yeah. can't have a large uh, delay uh, output yeah. delay. And similar thing will uh, will hold, I think. Okay. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Victor Hernandez Santa Maria asks. Uh, <laughs> Yes, thank you for the talk. I have a small question. Is it possible to extend these techniques to the case where the state equation has an additive or multiplicative noise term? Uh, sorry, uh, an additive or multiplicative what? Noise. A noise term. Oh, sorry. Um, this is something, to be honest, something uh, a topic I'm not familiar with, but I believe it can because um, I don't know if I put it in the reference at the beginning. I don't. Be no, I didn't. Um, recently, you have a work by uh, uh, Kakacze's uh, group uh, in Italy, Germany, and so on, who have designed a prediction-based controller um, in the case of uh, time varying delays, but with um, uh, no, it's for Wiener process with. Uh, input uh, time varying input delay. So if they were able to do that in that context, uh, I'm pretty sure that we can mix the things, uh, the two techniques together and uh, extend the tools I presented to the case where you have um, an, a noise uh, as well in the dynamics. Thank you. Somebody else has a comment or question? Well, if not, uh, let's uh, thank again our 